The first goal and first victory of Rangers' epic march to nine championships in a row came in the unlikely surroundings of Douglas Park Hamilton through Graham Souness's million-pound summer signing, Gary Stevens. Durant making space for Stevens. It's him, yes! Gary Stevens in the final minute of the first half. did its job, water shot, a brilliant header from Ali McCoist. Two weeks later came one of the best remembered victories of the entire record-breaking run as Rangers recorded their biggest league victory of a Celtic for 29 years. Uh, that one was one of the memorable ones in the sense that we had had Celtic coming as champions to Ibrox for the first game of the new season. We went down 1-0 immediately, which uh, it was a big blow to any team, but we came back that day and uh, it was a fantastic performance by the players for the, the next hour or so of that match, where it, uh, I can remember, I think with maybe half an hour to go, we were 5-1 up. Ray Wilkins will take the free kick. Goff is in the box once again. So is Butcher. Back to Brown. Blocked by McCarthy, there's McCoy. Goff and Butcher have gone up. It's launched in field by Stevens. There's Butcher. Back with Wilkins. Absolutely magnificent from Ray Wilkins. Well, a goal made in England. The throw from Gary Stevens. The header on from Terry Butcher. The stunning volley from Wilkins. And Andrews scarcely moved. Here's Durant retrieving it for Rangers. McCoy nods it on, an awkward one for Andrews. And the ball is in the net. It's a goal for Rangers. McCoy to Walters. Walters now facing McCarthy. Getting in a fine cross. Judging the fight well, on Brown. Making it trouble as Ali McCoist. There he goes this time at Walters. Mark Walters makes it five. My knowledge of Rangers historical background coming in there then. I was desperate for the boys to go on and, and obviously get another couple of goals to equal the Celtic score against Rangers uh, back in the 50s. So. I don't think Graham realised the significance of the result for us to try and get the seven. He came on, I think it was 5-1, he came on and, and started to slow the pace down and, and it was, there was a few years uh, we were unhappy with him at that time. Marcel, Coiste, Gennanti, uh, Bomber, you know, the, we all had a wee word about ourselves, you know, and we were all calling him so-and-sos, but at the end of the day, 5-1, we've got to be happy with that, but we, we really wanted that 7 and I don't think he realised how important that was for us. I mean, I didn't even knew about that, to be honest, and uh, with a lot of the English players who I'd mentioned with Drinks and Mark and... Ray Wilkins on the side. It was just a case of well, just make sure that you know the games, see the game out, keep possession, and not take the Mickey in the end, but just you know finish the game, dominate the game, and let Celtic remember that that defeat. The five-one thrashing of Celtic heralded the start of a run of six successive victories for Rangers, which only came to an end with defeat at Pataudry on the day one of the country's most promising young players was dreadfully injured. The severity of the injury in itself was one that I had never encountered uh, in a period of time um, that I've been involved in football. Um, it was a terrific play. Um, that was a blow to us. But football clubs recover, but uh, you feel for the player in this instance. It's, it's been a long and a hard road for him, and he's came back and played occasionally and played very well for us occasionally, but never, I don't think, at the level that he would have hoped um, when he started out. Oh, it was a massive blow. Uh, 
I have always said to people, I didn't realise the potential Ian Janant until he was away, you know, until he was missing. You know, you were you weren't getting the runs from midfield and you weren't getting people, him, he holds the ball up and takes people on, you know, you weren't getting that anymore. And uh, it, was, it was a really big loss for us. By the end of November, the ownership of the club was about to change. Manager Graham Souness had become a director when Aberdeen came to Ibrox. It's golf. Self-made millionaire David Murray's drive and determination to take Rangers onto a different level would bring the club unprecedented success in the years to come. While there was another thrilling victory against Celtic in the New Year match at Ibrox. Celtic to take this. It's just there, yes. Morris, one nothing. Been the same at the team that scored first in these games lost quite heavily. So. Uh, yeah, that was that was a, that was a great feeling. We always oh, seem to have a, a quite a good New Year's Day um, record against Celtic. So it was, and I scored in that game the four-one as well with a, a free goal. I obviously to score three goals, which made up a little bit for the fact that I'd scored the own goal in the three-one. Now that is a free kick. Free kick to Rangers. Wilkins will take this. Is Butcher with it? It's in. Brown on towards Ferguson. Here Drinkle. Feels for a penalty is given. It's there. Rangers are in the lead. Two goals to one. Mark Walters puts them there. Ferguson with the shot is there. Straight to McCall. Drinkle. That's a beautiful ball. Here's Walter through. Walters with a great chance. And he done it. Number four for Rangers in a breakaway. You know, we won for one quality goals as well, and you know, it, was, it was good because you don't, in the season, beat your your main rivals like five one and four one. You know, it's it's a great feeling. And then we had to go back to Parkhead, and we won two one as well, and played well on that day. So we had three good wins against their one that season in the league. The win at Celtic Park in April was to be the first in the East End for nine years. Bit of jockeying for position in there, and that's him. There's Ferguson with a short oh, it's a brilliant one and he's gone in it's a second for Rangers the goalkeeper couldn't stop it and I think Ali got the final touch Ali McCoy's a superbly struck free kick there it whistled and brilliantly saved or stopped and Ali McCoy is just getting in the head in. By the end of April, victory over Hearts at Ibrox would be enough to give Rangers the title, with two of the goals coming from an unlikely source. Walters is there. Wilkins and Sterling. And there it is, and it's in. Beautiful by Sterling. at each other, look at this, comedy of errors with Drinkle well that's not a bad ball there, a great goal Sterling looking for Walters and he just gets him there Price. oh brilliant goal Drinkle, oh yes superb goal here's Ferguson on to Cowan there's a race forward ball side Drinkle, he's done it, the second, Rangers fourth, well there's an almighty roar going up over Ibrox, 
final whistle has gone at Petrodre. It is nothing each, and the Rangers supporters realise that. I'm not sure if the Rangers players do, but the championship is Rangers or, technically speaking, they're four minutes away from it. Ibrox has erupted. Graham Sinnes' team had won the championship in style with a run of 14 wins in their last 16 matches, nine of them consecutively. The fans celebrated loud and long. Terry Butcher accepted the trophy for a Rangers side who would eventually take the title by a six-point margin over runners-up Aberdeen. We were delighted to get the championship again and I think it showed that uh, the reversal that we suffered in the previous season wasn't going to be tolerated by anybody I that we were wanting first place and we got that back again and uh, you know that was uh, the start of a, a long run of championships for us but I think certainly one of the most important because I let Celtic who are I still say in any sense our biggest rivals I let them know that the law they won it the previous season, they were going to have to up their standards if they, if they wish to get it back from us again. July the 10th, 1989, a day no old firm fan will ever forget. The day David Murray and Graham Sunnis' declaration of intent for the new Rangers involved the controversial signing of a former Celtic idol. And then I remember Graham saying to me uh, one Saturday, I think it was you know, roughly after a, one of the first friendly games there, yeah, I think I'll go and try and sign Morris Johnson. <laughs> Which to, uh, <laughs> to me, <laughs> I thought, well, well, well <laughs> that's just typical Graham. So I said, no. <laughs> He fully appreciate. <laughs> Obviously, he did appreciate. I mean, he'd, he'd been at Rangers at that time three years, so he knew exactly what the situation was. Um, I thought, well, you know, we'll sit down and we'll need to think about this. But uh, they thought about it, and uh, I had always liked him as a player. I must say, I thought uh, he was a really good player. And when he came to Rangers, I think he did show that he was a really good player. It was first and foremost football, but at the same time, it gave us the opportunity to break this historical baggage which Rangers had collected and to prove to everybody that wasn't the case and I think that was a, an important milestone in the club. Yeah, we, we just couldn't believe it, we were dumbstruck. I mean we'd heard one or two things within the club but we know nah, it's, it's a wind up because Glasgow is a big rumour factory and so many players have been alleged to have signed and everything else. And then when we were out in Italy obviously it was spoken to us that he, he had signed and was flying out to, to join us. So. It was a, a very muted Rangers squad that went out to Choco in Italy and when Morris joined us, flew by helicopter into the, to the mountain camp sort of thing, as only Morris would do, he wouldn't, he wouldn't come by car, he'd come by helicopter. Um, it would normally be a gold-plated helicopter for Morris. No made the challenge, it allows Ferguson to pick it up. That's for Johnston, he's onside, a great chance for Rangers! I remember him coming out and he was, he was getting pulled for every angle. Uh, you know, and the Celtic fans were going off their head and the Rangers fans were trying to make him mad with applauding him and shouting his name. And, you know, that was good that the Rangers fans got behind him. But Morris Johnson was immense. He just took it in his stride. He's a sort of a brilliant character that sort of thrives on that sort of atmosphere and that sort of intimidation and that pressure. And he, and he did well. I mean, he responded to it well. I don't know how he would have carried on if he hadn't scored that winner. Munro to Walters. This Johnston. Stevens. Johnston. minute, got booked for his over celebrations. He didn't quite win all the Rangers supporters over that day, but it must have been over about 99%. Ray Wilkins was one player who had never had to worry about winning over the Rangers fans. The former Chelsea, Manchester United and AC Milan player was a class act who made a significant impact during his time at Ibrox. 
He won a special place in the affections of every Rangers supporter as he said his goodbyes on a foggy day against Infirmly. That's meant for Johnston, and he's done it. Oh, what a superb goal! That was a magnificent pass from Wilkins, it really was. It really was super. Watch it. It went all the way through. Johnson onside, brought it down. Never an easy chance, but he made it look so. He was great on the pitch because he just used to give the ball to him and like for free kicks and corners and set plays and everything else. He was there, he knew what to do and calm things down. And if you've got someone like that in front of you, like a, a little midfield general, then it's you know it's great. And off the pitch as well, we used to we had a few drinking sessions with him and uh, I know he said I said he looks after himself well, but he can drink a bit as well. <laughs> I wish he would have stayed for another couple of years because I really, really enjoyed playing alongside him and he was a tremendous benefit to me. Rangers celebrated the arrival of the 90s in the ideal style with their first New Year win at Celtic Park since 1964. He has a good going. Here's Backman. That's a better ball. Johnston. Here's McCoy's. Backman, he scored. That's a beautiful goal by Rangers. Spackman, Rangers' new signing in his debut in an old firm game. Gary Stevens. That's Joe Monroe. Brown has gone forward. That's a good cross. Up goes Johnston. Corner not too decisive with the clearance. Here's Walters. Testing and teasing there, but in defence. 1-0 to Rangers! The extravagantly talented Mark Walters was a vital member of the team who would go on to make it two in a row. Both as a creator and a scorer of goals, his skills were appreciated by supporters and teammates alike. Just look at the way Walters turns here, makes space for himself for the shot away from Connor. Hi, Mark was one of these... Uh boys that he could keep quiet for eight or nine minutes of the game but and then he could just turn you a wee spot of magic and, and win you the game, you know, he was or yeah, he could terrorise defences for the for start to finish for the ninety minutes. You know, he was tremendous skill. I thoroughly enjoyed working with him. He was always liable to do a little bit different and even nearer the end of his time here, um, after watching him for a few seasons he could come up with a trick in terms of beating a player that he had never seen before. And uh, he was a very good player for us. Mark Walters got his name on the score sheet against Celtic in April as Rangers ended a disappointing run of five matches without a win which was threatening to undermine their championship challenge. Anton Rogan. A clear penalty. Of paramount importance for Rangers this. And Bonner got to it but couldn't keep it out. Mark Walters, 1-0. McCoyce and again Ferguson going a hunting and uh, Goff once more oh and Johnston picked out by McCoyce 2-0 splendid goal Dobchik is hurt and was actually playing players onside this is Walters Johnston oh and McCoyce has he given another penalty I think he has and Ali McCoyce given the chance to break the post-war record of league goals jointly held at the moment with Derek Johnston who's here at the ground today here goes McCoyce he's done it! 3-0 and he's had to wait a long time it was a big turning point at the end of the season because no matter how much you know, I mean championships you've won or cups you've won and everything else, there comes a time in the season when question marks will be will be asked and the team doesn't win a few games and you know it's a, it's a crisis, it's a disaster, it's a, a national tragedy and everything else and you you know you bounce back from that and it's how you bounce back from that and for how long you continue a, a run after that which is important and we did well after that. I think that we lost the game and possibly to the end of the season. They didn't, and the Rangers captain led the celebrations at Tannadice when the title was finally won with two games to spare. 
you get to the stage of the season when you go away from home, no club likes another one to win a championship on their ground. And it was a very tight game that night, it was a very hard game. Um, I still my no right foot crossed, and, uh, Trevor Stephen Header might have been an unusual way to win it, but uh, delighted nonetheless. Watch the way he clinically finished that off, Maine with no chance, 13 minutes gone, Rangers take the lead. Right in the last kick of the game, and, uh, I got the ball, I was coming out of defence, and the ball was right at my feet, and the referee blew the whistle. And I picked this ball up and it was like picking up the championship trophy, you know, I just wanted to kiss the ball or something. It was like, yes, what a feeling it was, you know, that we'd won it. And it was then that it's party time. Two in a row for Rangers, with ten players appearing in more than 24 of the 36 fixtures. That largely settled side conceded just 19 goals, while at the other end, Mo Johnston was the club's top scorer. The third of Rangers' unforgettable nine seasons was to prove a traumatic one in many ways. It also produced the closest title race of them all. Mark Hatley's arrival from Monaco was a significant summer signing. The fans were shocked, however, just a few weeks into the season by the departure of the club captain. Graham thought the fellow wasn't fit and, and uh, it, was, it was a case of, you know, his opinion was, was always one that mattered. So I was left out and never played again, it was after that game at Tannenice, which is ironic really because of so many good memories a few months earlier when I scored a, a spectacular on goal, one of the best on goals ever again and um, he left me out and that was the beginning of the end um, it was disappointing in the way, the way that things happened after that but when you get two strong personalities like mine and, and Graham's you know, something's going to give and uh, in the end I moved on and when you do leave the club you do realize you, you then realize what you had and what the club is all about, I suppose. And uh, you look back with fond memories about what you've done and about your your time at the club. Terry was a tremendous captain, uh, always willing to give you advice, uh, give you a bit of stick as well when you deserved it. And uh, ah, great captain, I loved him when he was here. He was a fantastic servant uh, for Rangers, and I think he'll go down as one of the the great captains. He had a great presence about him within the dressing room with the rest of the players and he carried that out onto the pitch and we've been fortunate to Rangers over a period of years to have many great captains and he certainly ranks among them. I don't know, in a way it's up to other people to to say their piece about me but I mean all I would try to do was to was to lead by example, was to rally the troops round and, and be what I'd seen other captains do in the past. After his goal on the opening day, Mark Hatley had struggled to find the net until Hibbs came to Ibrox in November. It's a great cross by Stephen. And Hatley scores! Mark goes cross. Hatley again! Sheer brilliance from Walters. Walters taking on Milne. By now, Rangers were well into a run of 15 league matches without defeat, which included victory at Celtic Park. There's Boris Johnston! Opportunism at his best! John Collins. There goes Elliot! Yes! Collins, looking for Fulton, who is caught there by Hamlet. The referee waves play on as Fulton lies on the floor. Celtic bench and sense by that is McCoy is in the clear a chance for Rangers. Here's McCoy, they must score. Rangers take the lead. Ali McCoy gets his 12th goal of the season. McCoy at this stage was playing second fiddle to the Hatley Johnston partnership, still scoring, but only as a substitute. Oh, at the beginning of the season, it was it was myself and, uh, and Morris, and it was always going to be myself and somebody else. And you know, I think that's possibly what a section of the crowd didn't understand. 
you know, I was always going to play, but it was going to be one or the other that was going to play with me. But uh, um, Coist is a clever man. I mean, he, he sat down, sat on the bench, got the nickname the judge, you know. Perhaps the blackest day in McCoy's season came just before Christmas, when a stunning double as a substitute against Aberdeen still wasn't enough to win him his place back in the starting lineup. I think it showed Alan McCoy's worth to any team, and uh, Alistair at that time would just be delighted uh, to show Graham and everybody else that he hadn't lost his knack of scoring, even though he wasn't getting the number of games that he would have liked. Fifteen goals in five matches during December sent Rangers into the Old Firm match at New Year in good spirits. There was never any chance of their long unbeaten run coming to an end. There's Walters. An awkward one, straight into the net! Walters has scored for Rangers! What did you know? There's Walters breaks for Rangers. Walters again. Sandy Robertson, beaten to that by Grant, but here's Robertson now with a great chance for Rangers, taking on Bonner, pulling it back for Haitley. Then with just five matches remaining in the race for the championship and Aberdeen breathing down Rangers' neck, Graham Souness dropped the bombshell. He was leaving to rejoin Liverpool. The shattering news could have cost Rangers the title, but chairman David Murray acted quickly and decisively. Graham made his decision. I had no pleasure in making the statement that this decision will haunt you for the rest of his life. And I mean, I mean that, it's just come back time and time again. But there was only one man for the job. And in fact, I knew Graham was coming back that day to discuss it with me. And I already discussed it with Walter. And when Graham said he'd like to stay at the end of the season, I said, I'm sorry, Graham, you're leaving today. And if we could have a press conference in an hour, and we'll tell the word. And Graham said, no, I want to stay. I said, Graham, you're not staying, you're going today. I spoke to Walter and I said, I don't want to confuse Graham going with you, being given the job, so let's leave it for a week. I said, but would you like the job? We'd love you to take over. And he said, there's not even a question. Walter said yes without even discussing terms. It was amazing. I was obviously delighted to have been offered the opportunity uh, to become the manager. Um, although the time was a difficult time and I knew that we were struggling team-wise and personnel-wise and it was going to be a struggle to the end of the season. There's no good time uh, or bad time to take a Rangers manager's job. You take it when you're offered it. Uh, Walter knew how things were run and the way the club, the behind the scenes was, was, was going and set up. And he was just the ideal you know, person and the ideal personality for the job. Aye, what was more, uh, not as aggressive as Graham, but Walter can be when he wants to be, uh, to get a point over. Uh, I had a to to two totally different managers in their style and approach. Uh, Walter, I'd say, is more cute about his, as his Graham would just go for the throat, the jugular. Walter Smith's first match as newly appointed Rangers manager was at Love Street, when substitute Sandy Robertson scored a vital late winner. But then Motherwell won 3 0 at Fir Park. Oh, come on, I mean, it's the Archie Knox game. I mean, uh, Archie just joined us as assistant manager that week, and when I was looking for someone to blame at the end of that one, um, it could only be him. So, incredibly, Rangers and Aberdeen would meet on the last day of the season, level in points, but with Alex Smith's side needing only to draw. Walter Smith was relishing the prospect. Well, in many ways, it was a good thing for me in the sense that uh, it gave me an early opportunity to prove that I could handle the situation um, at Rangers and it was as simple as that and it was a challenge for me to get them all together and it was actually a challenge for us to actually get players out onto the training ground in the week leading up to that we didn't have the best of build ups but we were reliant a great deal on the spirit that I had built up within our camp over the period and I think that that spirit uh, was more than showing uh, on the day of the game. Incredible atmosphere that day, unbelievable. It's probably the best to play in because the fans were so uptight and they were getting behind us and the atmosphere was tremendous. There was a tremendous atmosphere about the ground. I mean, one that will never really be recreated. I mean, I think if a club could show the power of its support, Rangers showed it that day. The tension inside Ibrox was almost tangible. The first goal would be crucial. Walters wants to bring the ball down and take on right. 
Going for the early cross, there's Haitley. It's a magnificent goal for Rangers. Five minutes from half time, and out runs he runs. There's Connor. Bring it up the line for Booth. The layoff was intended for Akimi, but he's released Johnston. Haitley waits in the middle, he will look to be offside. Well, the referee's allowed the goal. And Rangers are two in front. Uh, we often have a competition uh, with an outlets to try and pick out where the players were playing at the end of that game and which positions they were in. And uh, there's some remarkable positional changes in that one. Uh, when I think to this day that I was in charge of the team and I was making them to play Terry Hill like a left back, Mark Haley outside left. Really, <laughs> but, uh, there's no bear thinking about Waiting to see if Brian McGinley will bring this match to an end and make it formally Rangers Championship. There it is. Rangers have won the championship. It was a victory. As I say, it was shared by everybody because the supporters that day, without a doubt, played an enormous part in helping the team raise their level um, to win us that championship. And it's a historic match because, I mean, again, we joined Kilmore on Hearts as the only teams to have played in that type of game. So it was an early encounter for everybody and uh, I must admit uh, that evening I did feel exhausted rather than elated. Against the odds, Rangers had made it three in a row. It had been a long, hard season. The celebratory champagne was hard earned. Captain for the day, Nigel Speckman collected the trophy on behalf of a team consisting largely of the walking wounded. Tom Cowan and John Brown had both been carried off during the game and a half-fit Ali McCoyst, who hadn't played for six weeks, had to come on as substitute. But the Rangers' spirit won through. Another championship had been won. Walter Smith's first full season in charge saw him make his mark in the transfer market, signing Andy Gorham, Alexei Mikhailichenko, David Robertson, Stuart McCall and Dale Gordon, amongst others. The New Look team started in brilliant fashion, beating St Johnston 6-0 on the opening day with a hat-trick from Mark Haightley. It looks as though it may well be a penalty kick to Rangers, so it's Maurice Johnston who'll take the penalty kick. Robertson again. Spikeman being hustled there by Davis. Showing a lot of confidence. That's for Housetrap. Brilliant ball. Hayley. Superb goal for Rangers. Mark Hayley scores. The referee Les Montrop has given another penalty kick to Rangers. Here's Johnston. Trying to set himself a shooting chance. Oh, that's brilliant play from Ferguson. Fine tackle there by Stephen. That's Haustra. That's for Haightley. He's onside. The great chance for Haightley. Superbly finished. Five goal deficit. And there's the head out for Haightley. That's the thought for Mark Haightley. We finished with the uh, League and Cup double at the end of that season and uh, some good football and uh, the partnership of McCoy and Haightley developed over the early part of it and went on to be one of the best striking partnerships I think the club have ever had. And it was two Haightley goals which won the opening Old Firm match of the season, Walter Smith's first as manager, with David Murray's good friend Sean Connery giving a new meaning to the term Rangers Bond in the director's box. Coin was well read by Goff. Uh, McCall. 
Here's Haithley, he's in the clear, it's a great chance for Rangers. Haithley against Bonner. Brilliant play from Haithley. Rangers take the lead. Well, it's played on well by Haithley for Johnston. Here's Haithley again, switching to his left foot. It's a second for Rangers. It's Mark Haithley once again. The following week, the highlight of a 2-0 win at Falkirk wasn't a goal, but a stunning piece of skill from one of the game's great enigmas, a player responsible for more debate amongst the fans than almost any other. All applause ringing around the stadium for Alexei Mikhilichenko. We have, a, I think, an expectation that every player that goes onto the pitch should run around all the time, and uh, Alexei uh, didn't share that view. Uh, he was... A tremendously talented player, you know, and anybody that uh, that saw Mikhailichenko in training and in games too. I mean, we take away from him uh, if we say that he never showed it in games. He had a very successful spell at Rangers. People are inclined to forget that. Personally, he's one of the best players that we've had here, ability-wise. Um, and as I say to you, some days he was up and down that pitch, and then other days he was just up the pitch. And Peter Heaster and him shared. Um, the wide and the left role for us, um, you know, over those first few seasons that I was a manager, and uh, they did so very successfully. But uh, Alexei Mikhailchenko is a terrific player. He's now moved into management, and I was interested to read a quote that he wants his team to work a bit harder than I've been doing. So uh, obviously, it's uh, <laughs> it's eventually rubbed off him. <laughs> Meanwhile, Rangers' season was gathering pace and Ali McCoyst was vindicating Smith's belief in him with a rich spell of goal-scoring form, which would go on to win him the Golden Boot. Hickley partnership produced the goods again in a vital 3-2 win at Pataudry in early December. He allows Gordon to take over, that's a great effort by Gordon and by Hickley. A superb finish by Hickley. Hickley's ball inside picked up by McCall, that's fine play by Hickley, his pace is good enough here, it's a great chance for Rangers. Our team at that time started to gel together and we were such that uh, we were getting a lot of balls into the penalty area which was, um, you know, meet and drink for Mark Haley and when they were down there, his link up with McCoy's meant that we were getting an awful lot of goals and we scored a tremendous amount of goals over the next two seasons uh, all down to them but I think we'll be first to say that the team in itself um, supplied them with great opportunities to score. I think when you grow up supporting Rangers and, and you look at uh, Miller and Brand, uh, other famous players that have you know, pulled on a jersey, uh, I would like to think that any supporter that saw them, although Jimmy Miller being a, a hero of mine, uh, I was sad to say that I think the McCoy's Haley partnership was probably um, as good as any that I've had, if not the best. Once again, the New Year clash with Celtic produced a Rangers victory and a memorable moment for one of the fans' favourites, John Brown. Peter Grant turning straight into Spackman, who's strong enough to get through White. Here's Dale Gold, this is a good chance for Rangers, right on the half-time whistle. Across to Haidley, here's McCoy! It's first blood to Rangers, right on the half-time whistle. His corner driven in and a bulleted header from Tony Mowbray. Gasolino maintaining possession well. Brown picks up the loose ball in midfield though. That's for McCoy. Marshall is committed. And McCoy can't get up and the ref is given a penalty. Well, 
Here's Hatley against Marshall. Beautifully taken penalty kick. Rangers are back in front. And Hatley gets his 14th goal of the season. Pretty setting it up for Galloway. Queuing up in the middle for this. Here's Collins. Setting it up for Paul McStay. It's a great effort by McStay and the save from Andy Gordon denies the Celtic captain. Hatley on the right. Holding the play up for Stevens. Spikeman again. John Brown's in the middle. Alstra on the left, McCoy's in the inside right position, here's Brown going all the way himself, that settles it! And everybody could see the joy that was on his face that day, and that's John Brown, a Rangers player. I think uh, over a period, you know, we have had players who have had uh, big reputations come to the club uh, here, but John Brown's are the type of players that you need and uh, every time he pulled on a Rangers jersey, he served them well. Rangers got stronger and stronger as the season progressed, losing just one league game in 24, finally clinching the title with three games to spare against St Mirren at Ibrox. And the cross posing no problems there for Andy Gorham. McCoy is going through here, the ball holding up in the breeze, and McCoy is going to score! Mikalichenko inside, McCoy's waiting in the middle, it's good play by Vinikom. This is Mikalichenko. Back it comes to Stevens. 2-0 to Rangers. Supported well by Vinikom. There's Hustra again. Now Durant. McCoy on the tongue. That's great play by McCoy. And no tension around because really have been playing second fiddle for most of the match then in trouble again as Mikhanichenko breaks and there's the chance of Hamstra and there goes the final whistle the championship is assured and these Rangers supporters now can begin the celebrations in earnest Rangers had won four championships in a row for the first time in more than 60 years. They had played 44 games, lost just five, and scored more than a century of goals for the first time since the war. In addition, the Scottish Cup was won for the first time in 11 years, just for good measure. The fans celebrated a fabulous season, but there was even better to come. Everybody played hard for each other and the unity was great and that pulled them through. So I think that was probably our greatest uh, era. Our team were ready for that season, there was no doubt about that. And they were absolutely fantastic throughout that season. Every one of Rangers' nine championships is special in its own way, but the team which made it five in a row are surely one of the great Rangers sides of all time. Rangers won the treble, went 44 matches without defeat, and after a fabulous European run, were within 90 minutes of the European Cup final. Yet there was little sign of the triumphs to come when Celtic came to Ibrox in August. Magnale comes clear with the ball for Celtic. Plenty of support waiting in the middle. Deflected there, and the goal for Celtic! Listen to the call. This is Durant. Another 
pace of the match has dropped just a little and we're seeing a lot more passes being put together by both sides Ten Hag to get there in time he did extremely well, the chance is on the equaliser from Ian Durant the draw with Celtic set Rangers off on a run during which they didn't lose a match in any competition for seven months an astonishing record of success built on the old cliche taking one game at a time there was actually no thought of an unbeaten run. The thought was winning. And, you know, when they look around our team, there were a lot of people who had great winners' attitudes uh, in our team. You know, Andy Gorham. Difficult for a goalie to portray that to the public, that he has a winner's attitude. But he loves winning. You can see that he hates the ball going behind him into the goal. He loves winning. You know, Richard Goff, John Brown, Stuart McCall. Ian Ferguson on the team, Mark Cately up front, are all of the type who hate losing. The majority of the boys that are professional footballers don't like losing. I mean, this is, that's taken for granted. But there's some, you know, show it worse than others and show determination not to lose um, more than others. And we were fortunate to have a lot of players on our team who were of that kind. Just three days after the unforgettable European victory at Leeds, Rangers headed for Parkhead. Once again, they rose to the challenge. And they got him taking every advantage, finds Hitley. In comes Dale Gordon. Ali McCoy's there. Here's Ian Durant. Ian Durant scores for Rangers. 32 minutes gone and a classic counter-punch by Rangers. By the time Celtic came to Ibrox at New Year, everyone was beginning to get the feeling that this could be a very special season. Ferguson playing it in, there's Haitley and Stephen! A goal of outstanding quality from Trevor Stephen! Five points clear of Aberdeen in early February, Rangers' visit to Pataudry was always going to be crucial to the championship race. Chances on through the middle, that's brilliant goalkeeping by Gorham. Richardson with a free kick, McLeish has gone forward, so is Irvin. Matalainen nodding it across. And a great save again from Gorham. Ian Jess holds his head, he can't believe it. There he goes, straight against the wall. Stephen sends it back in, there's Haightley. It's in, Rangers have scored. It's a sucker blow from Rangers. The title was finally secured at Broomfield with four games still to play. Ali McCoist sadly had broken his leg playing for Scotland and Portugal. And although he was missing on the great day, for the second consecutive season he had scored 34 league goals and won himself another golden boot. Head in possession. Looking for McSwiggin, that's good control by McSwiggin. The ball's going into the net. Rangers are ahead, and it's Gary McSwiggin. One minute of the second half gone. And Ali McCoy's replacement, Gary McSwiggin, sends the Rangers fans into a state of joy and delirium. The final whistle goes. Rangers have won the match, and they've won the league championship for the fifth consecutive time. Nice to win that. <laughs> <laughs> I feel very proud, you know what I mean? I can't actually put my feelings in it. In the words, I feel. Um, it's right, but you, you see the supporters how they are today. You know, they're just as happy as us. Everyone says five in a row, it must be getting boring. And, you, know, but the, you can see the players, the reaction of the players, how much it means to them to win. And also the supporters, you know, it means so much to them. You know, there was no superstars, we were all working for each other and uh, we all battled for each other, we all backed each other up, everything that we did. A tremendous spirit about the place uh, and also I think that season with the early European rounds we beaten uh, Leeds as well, you know, and it just all stemmed from there, winning the Skull Cup against Aberdeen the following week and things just went on and it just steamrolled right through the whole season. You have to keep striving to be better and every season you put the pressure on yourself, you do the double, you have to win the treble. And if you don't win the treble, the double's not good enough. But that was the way it was. I mean, we're doing doubles and trebles and then doubles again. And uh, 
you know, the, the amount of pressure that team, that squad of players was under for that period of time was incredible. And I think it's just a great tribute to everybody that was associated in that period, how we did handle it. So high were Rangers' ambitions for 93-94 that incredibly even another double was greeted with slight disappointment as a horrendous run of injuries ended the dream of historic back-to-back -back trebles. But another championship would be won after an opening day win over Hearts. And Smith has lost it, this is Hagen! Perfect answer from Mark Hitley. I did say earlier that people don't realise how um, much it takes out players to continue playing at a level they play at. You're the champions, everybody's gunning for you. The uh, lifter level of game, okay. We'd gone through a spell there where we managed to win the league in the cup in a f the first season I was manager. We then won the treble, had a fantastic run in the European Cup. and when we were entering that third season, we were showing signs of wear and tear. We won the League Cup. Uh, we managed to go on and win the league. And it's one of my biggest disappointments that that team didn't have the accolade as the only team ever to win two trebles back to back. And uh, when we lost in a league in a Scottish Cup final to Dundee United, it'll go down as one of the biggest disappointments out of my career. Not for a personal point of view, but just from the point of view, I felt like that team deserved recognition. As it was, they've been the only team in history Scottish football to win seven domestic trophies in a row. So it shows that uh, you know they were a tremendous side. No fewer than 11 players underwent surgery. Walter Smith was rarely able to field the side he wanted, and Rangers struggled in the early part of the season. Victory at Tannadice in October ended a run of just one win in eight games. Said it goes to Hayley. A second for Rangers. Hayley gets his ninth of the season. Mikalichenko. Hayley goes forward. Playing in early for Halstra. It's a classic for Rangers. Duncan Ferguson had been the summer's only big money signing, but sadly the big man Zybrook's career was to prove a major disappointment, although he almost managed to snatch a winner as a makeshift Rangers side fought out a no-scoring draw at Celtic Park. In late November, the arrival of Gordon Jury triggered a dramatic improvement in Rangers' form. Jukebox would go on to contribute a dozen league goals. Only player of the year Mark Hately scored more. At that stage, we had to keep changing the team around all the time. We never really got the consistency that was required with injuries to Richard Goff and people like that, that uh, who were important players for us. And when you change your team and you get injuries to your very important players, then you're liable to get upsets. So there was a concern there. I wouldn't have said to you it reached the stage where we were really worried about it. You worry when you lose, managers worry. Managers worry when they win, but uh, you worry when, when you lose. But at that stage, you know, we um, were confident that we could come back and do it. The sequence of New Year victories over Celtic continued. For once, though, Rangers were the underdogs. And we were going to Parkhead that day with an enormous amount of injuries. And Celtic were firm favourites to win that match. And uh, a fantastic start to the game there. But, uh, I'll never forget where you were a little bit apprehensive yourself, you know, knowing that we had a lot of players out. And all of a sudden you find yourself, you know, winning the game and looking as though we could score in every attack that we're playing. It's goal number 21 of the season and it's scored in just 58 seconds. So the settling in process has not yet been completed. But either side, the jury breaks there. That's great play. Neil Murray's in the clear. It's a great chance for the second. Murray against Bonner. And here's Mikhanichenko. It's number two for Rangers. Tackled by Collins. Advantage allowed with Rangers in possession. There's Hatley again. Now Jury. 
and the third scored by Mikhail Chinko. And once again, the Celtic defence was ripped asunder. That was a terrific one for, for us. And, and we managed to get back, and even then, I think we went in that game 3 0 up. Celtic came back to 3 2, and it was uh, really Kuznets of goals that got us the fourth there. So. That's Kuznets off. That's the fourth. That settles it all right. All that right, Kuznets off with that dipping body. Rangers were now off on a 17-match unbeaten run, which would see them safely through to another championship. But there were a few anxious moments along the way. Person's header, touched by McCall. This is Jury. Rangers always dangerous in these closing stages. They've proved it so often this season. The fight to the final whistle. Here's McCoy! Well, Ali McCoy ties up the points in dramatic fashion. Rangers eventually took the title by three points from Aberdeen after a nervous last few weeks which brought just two points from their last five matches. The long and frustrating catalogue of injuries meant that title number six was ground out rather than won in style. The strain was beginning to show. That year's success was more hard-earned than most. Of all the players brought to Ibrox during Rangers' history-making run, surely none has been more significant than Brian Laudrup, a £2.2 .2 million um, signing from Fiorentina in the summer of 1994. He would go on to become one of Rangers' greatest ever players, while the Frenchman who signed at the same time, Basil Bolly, was probably one of the biggest disappointments. Both would play in the opening day victory of a mother -in. Good ball to Laudrup. Robertson's racing out of the fence, in support. Loudrop getting away from Shannon there, now doing the same. It's one for Murray. It's McPherson to Loudrop. He's popped up again on the right-hand side. Taking on McKinnon, floating in the cross. It's a good one, it's Hitley! And Hitley makes the breakthrough. I've rarely seen him do with more of the kind of ability that Brian has. Usually when you get people that can dribble and maybe not in terms of being the best in the release of the ball, um, you know, sometimes they can dribble they're a little bit slow or whatever. He's the pace, the control, the touch, the pass, the finish. He's, he had all those things and uh, fantastic he's been for us uh, in the period that he's been here. When the heat's on, he'll just take the ball for a run and, and beat four or five players and <laughs> or when you needed a goal he would beat four or five players and get the ball in the net for, uh, into the box for big marker Coyster, you know, tremendous. I, I can't speak highly enough of him, he's just he's probably one of the best that I've worked with and, and seen. Alan McLaren then arrived from Hearts in October and was immediately thrown into the old firm match at Hamden, Celtic's temporary home that season. Touch from Hitley. It's picked up by Boyd. It's caught by Charlie Miller. Through now for Hitley! Oh, that is a magnificent goal by Mark Hitley! So they're hoping maybe they can get themselves a free kick just outside the box and with uh, Collins in that, but here's Boyd coming forward. Oh, and that's a tremendous goal! Free kick to Rangers, quickly taken. Played shot by McCall to Loudrop. Good ball through again for Robertson. It's Hitley! Oh, tremendous play by Rangers. What a stunning ball through by Loudrop to Robertson. The cross from Robertson and Mark Hitley gets his second goal of the match. And here's a break on for Loudrop. Tremendous pace, he's past the goalkeeper! That's a 
sensational goal by Lodrup. And Celtic are trying to build up. We were always aware of the fact that he had to meet the challenge. And I think that game there showed that we were more than capable of meeting the challenge, even though we and ourselves were probably not playing our best football. Yet the win over Celtic once again proved significant as Rangers embarked on a run of 14 matches without defeat, including a sparkling win at Dundee United. Jury, Houses in the middle, McCoy's arriving, Loudrup's here as well. Still it's Loudrup. Great skills again by him! Oh, marvellous goal by Loudrup! I mean, we went there that day, if I can remember correctly, first with Jobs from... Uh, the Indian United manager stating that the team was over the hill and uh, we turned on a terrific performance that day. I don't know whether the motivation that was given to us by Ivan Golak was uh, anything to do with it, but certainly the lads turned on, I think, one of the better performances of the season going up there and one of a terrific performance from Brian Lodrup. themselves in the Championship hopes a lot of good here this afternoon. That's played through now for Ian Durant. Oh, magnificent. A great pass by Lodrup and Ian Durant. Makes it Dundee United nil, Rangers three, another delightful pass from Loudrup. Durant running through and picking his spot. In January of 1995, Peter Hoostra, the Dutch winger who had played such an important role in Rangers' successful run, said his goodbyes with a two-goal contribution to victory at Falkirk. By March, Rangers were well on their way to another championship when suddenly the winning of football matches was put into its proper perspective by the tragically early death of one of the club's most popular players. The passing of Davy Cooper at just 39 plunged Ibrooks into mourning. The massive floral tributes at the Ibrooks gates provided a heartbreaking reminder of the special place Davy Cooper had occupied in every Rangers fan's heart. Tributes were paid by supporters from all over the world as Coop's former teammates determined to win another championship in his honour. In times of adversity, team spirit, that magical and sometimes elusive quality, tends to carry Rangers through. The Ibrox dressing room has always been a special place. Psychologists call it more bonding, don't they? Uh, we may have other words for it in Glasgow, but uh, certainly that's what they call it there. But it's, there's no doubt that it helps, and it, it helps develop a team spirit. So when things start to get a bit rough, everybody knows that they're in there together. It's maybe led our squad to any one or two other problems, which when it's allied to these nights out, people think that that's um, all they do is go out and enjoy themselves all the time, but uh, it's not like that. I've been here the nine years with my cousin and Durant, and they're, also, they're probably like brothers to me now. You know, they're, they're really close, even after games, and you know, they'll phone you and have a wee chat with you if things aren't gone right, and you know, put the arm on you sort of, a, in a way. And, uh, and have a wee talk with you and, and uh, that's what you need you know you don't it's hard to say you know I, I don't know of any other teams but what you don't need is maybe getting a wee bit of stick and maybe they phone you and people don't speak to you in the dressing room you know but I gather that goes on but at the end of the day here that will never happen and it was Ian Durant who inspired Rangers to a 3-2 win over Aberdeen in April which brought the title within touching distance It's Heatherston. And he's shot with that when Charlie Miller comes in, does well against Stephen Wright. He's got Loudrop running through the middle. Aberdeen chasing back here. Still it's Miller. Through for Loudrop. Great play by Loudrop. It's Miller. And in comes Durant. And Rangers take the lead. Brown playing it through, looking for Miller. Still it's Charlie Miller. Getting in the cross. Attack from Hatley. Here comes Loudrop. Kimmy. Now it's Shearer driving it across, the chance on for Aberdeen and Dodds pulls one back. Switch back out to Dodds. Grant gets in the cross, it's Shearer and Aberdeen have done it. This is Clement. Loudrup. Loudrup was involved in both of Rangers' goals and the setting up of them. Can he conjure up something else here? Good skills again. Clellan, that ball takes a deflection. Hitley! It's done in! 
Eight days later, Hibbs came to Ibrox with Rangers ready to celebrate title number seven. Brian Loudrup had been named Scotland's Player of the Year and the player who had been so touched and honoured to be compared to Davy Cooper enjoyed the party as much as anyone. Thomas quickly taken, it's with Loudrup. And Rangers take the lead through Gordon Jury. A simple goal in the end. And the four minutes left. One goal apiece. This is Durant. Great play by Ian Durant. A marvellous goal by Ian Durant. Ran onto the return pass, picked his spot beyond Jim Layton. Rangers going in for the kill. It's Loudrup again, finding Mikhailichenko. Loudrup runs on the outside of him, still it's Mikhailichenko! Oh, it's magnificent! This is Jackson, it's all about consolation for Hibbs now. And there goes the final whistle! Rangers were in seventh heaven, another championship had been secured. With three points on offer for a win for the first time, Walter Smith's side won the title by a massive 15 points from Motherwell. Once again, the champagne flowed in the Ibrox dressing room. A lot of people look back and say, ah, you won the championship easily. They forget the Aberdeen games. They forget the times when we only won maybe from two or three points from Hearts and things like that. It's very difficult and uh, I don't think that anybody in their right mind would look towards nine and really I, I got to say that really it was only when we were entering our eighth season that I started to look towards that it was just a matter of continuing the job you were doing and hope that you could continue to win the championship which is one of the requirements of being in this club The summer of 95, the arrival of Gaza And I, I never quite realised just how much the media craved for a Paul Gascoigne story. I certainly know now, but um, at that time I didn't. But all we were concerned about was we were getting a footballer who, like Mark Cately, for instance, had missed a lot of the previous seasons through injury. So we were taking a little chance that uh, you know those injuries would be okay. Uh, there was no doubt that he's an enormously gifted footballer. Obviously he's got to settle in first and then about a minute later we gave him it. But uh, oh, McCoyst and uh, we Durante, the usual, the pranksters are sticking deep heat in his pants and stealing his socks and you know all the usual stuff. But Gaza takes it and, and to be fair, you know, he's, he's a great laugh of cell. Good guy to have in the dressing room, does a few pranks his cell. But uh, to get one of the top English players here, was midfielders, was incredible. And his reputation. Uh, you see him playing, you know, he's, he's a genius. I believe he's given us an edge. In some games we wouldn't have won without Paul, there's no doubt about that. His off the field stuff is the price that you have to pay if you wish Paul Gascoigne to play for you. I personally like him and I've never had a problem with him. He's always been honourable to me, he's never broken his word to me. As I said, the only thing you can criticise him is some of the things that have happened away from the park. At the end of the day, he's been signed first and foremost for a football for football, and I believe he's delivered that to the club. But as Paul Gascoigne was arriving, another of the major contributors to nine in a row was leaving. Mark Hately's Ibrox career was over, at least for a while. And I just felt it was the right time, and so did Mark. And uh, you know, that led to him going down to, to QPR, and he's now in management uh, at Hull, and now he'll have to make these decisions himself. You look back in, in hindsight now and it was probably the worst decision I ever made. But uh, when, you, when you're down, you're injured. I uh, just had uh, two operations, one on the knee and an ankle. I think when you are low, you do make uh, um, rash decisions. But as um, soon as I got away from the place, I knew it wasn't, it wasn't the right thing to do. Meanwhile, Celtic were re-emerging as the major threat to eight in a row. They would lose only one league match all season. Crucially, it was to Rangers. Donnelly doing well with the flank shot that takes the ball wide. Salenko. Well, that's good play. Good footwork. Looking for Cleland. Great header! Alan Cleland for Rangers! 
Bosch McKinley. And Hoydock waits in the middle. Two across though, one easily by McLaren. Two against two up front here. Selenko and McCoy together. That's good play by Selenko. McCoy says Gascoigne racing through the middle. It's great play for Rangers. And Gascoigne has scored! It's a magnificent goal by Gascoigne. And Gaza was still firmly in the spotlight by the time of the next old firm encounter in November. It was to prove an unforgettable afternoon. It was a fantastic match that one, I mean, in the sense that from a supporter's point of view, it had everything. From a manager's point of view, it was a bit of a nightmare because really and truly we were having no influence. I would think Tommy Burns would agree as well, that we were having no influence in what was happening. The game was going from end to end. Richard Goff, this is Gascoigne, still it's Gascoigne, forcing it through, chance on here for Loudrop, and it's a great goal by Loudrop. Colin who strikes it, Hughes as well, forward, claims for a penalty kick there as he was challenged and it's given. So John Collins starts his run, and it's gone in. Again, Goff's forward, so too is Petric. Again, there's a fair bit of movement the far side of the box. Gascoigne strikes it in. And it's now. Super Ali does it again. Got the player on the ground now as Rangers mount another attack. Well, that's a slack one by Boyd. Almost allowing Solenka to come in. He's got it again. And I just remember when the coach ran into the net and picking the ball up and kissing the ball and shouting at the Rangers fans. You know, it's emotion, that's all it is. It's just emotion and excitement all rolled into one. I've never really been involved in a game like that one before. And I hadn't, it was, I have never been involved where the, the whole situation just gets up and takes on a bit of its own. And the game just got played there by two sets of players who were intent on the team winning. So Rangers and Celtic have a lot of critics, but in that evening, it gave football supporters everything that football should be. By the time Hibs came to Ibrox on the last Saturday of the year, the old firm were locked in battle for the title. Rangers that day were simply unstoppable. Jury takes a pass on Gascoigne, Charlie Miller's onside, and Rangers are one up. Still under pressure now from Loudrop, who steals the ball from him. Uh, attacks Hunter. Still in possession, Loudrop. A chance on this time! Jury with a second! Miller. Patience. The name of the game now for Rangers. Good tackle by Tweed on Selenko, that's Gordon Jury. And that's a terrific goal for Rangers. Oh, beat footwork again from Gascoigne, and away from Hunter. Charging into the area now. Oh, that's a classic. And here come Rangers again. Julian with a hat trick. He's done it. Oh, Salenko. Six. Ian Ferguson breaks for low drop. Good tackle by Jackson. There's Judy. The next two matches with Celtic were both drawn, so the title race was still very much on. But with just half a dozen games left, Rangers looked like slipping up at Kirkcaldy. You know, with Celtic breathing down our necks, we found ourselves going there. And we struggled, I mean, from start to finish in that game. I want to say start to finish, start to the period of time we went down 2 1, then Alec and 1, and uh, as usual, the Superman shot. This line's caught up. Up goes Petric and McCoy's! The equaliser of the Rangers! Seven minutes from the end! Till the pressure's on. Gascoigne again with a corner. Get his at full stretch. Straight to Walter 
Ipswich with the goals. One minute from the end. By the time Aberdeen came to Ibrox in the penultimate game of the season, Rangers' fate was once again in their own hands. And it was to be Gaza's day. That's a chance for the Dons. And it's Goffey's here and it's Irvin. And Aberdeen sensationally take the lead. Well, Goff will be unhappy that he failed to get that cross away. There's Gascoigne now, can he produce some magic? Still it's Gascoigne! Oh yes! A tremendous goal by Gascoigne! It's been very evenly balanced, here's Gascoigne now, pushing forward, showing great determination! Oh he's done it again! It's unbelievable! To touch, here's Loudrup. Jury's breaking forward, McCoyce is away as well. McCoyce is running through the middle, Gary Smith goes across to try and cut him off. It's Jury in possession, Robertson's arriving as well. The Jury goes down, that's a penalty! It's a penalty! Well, Gordon Jury missed from the penalty spot last week, it's Gascoigne who's going to take this one, and Gascoigne has already scored from the penalty spot. This is the hat trick in the championship! Rangers are champions for the eighth consecutive season. It had been an incredible first season for Gascoigne, even by his outrageous standards. Inevitably, Gaza was voted Player of the Year. Equally inevitably, he led the championship winning celebrations. awful pressure placed on us um, at the start of that one um, and a well-meaning pressure from supporters because they all wanted to equal Celtic's record and uh, the one pressure that I felt throughout the season was the fact that you know for this team it was the opportunity to do it I don't know whether the club will ever get itself into a situation again where we can try and achieve nine in a row so therefore um, it was a big, big season for us and was always going to be a season where there was a great deal of pressure on Rangers and Celtic, Rangers to win and Celtic to prevent us winning. In fact, the entire historic season would revolve around the four Old Firm matches. The first at Ibrox at the end of September. Well, the problem lay for Celtic, but they get the ball out of the area for long enough to get some respite and put some pressure on Rangers. Here's Alberts. Van Bossen coming into the left, which he does so well. Alberts. Splendid save by Marshall. Let's go for the header. We're lucky to have Terry Butcher as a captain in this one. We're fortunate to have Richard to take his place. And his leadership qualities and the inspiration that he's given the players around him um, has been. Um, a cornerstone on which the nine in a row success has been built. I don't have any doubts about that. As I say, uh, we've been fortunate to have a lot of good players at that time. But uh, Richard Goff took it beyond being a good player. You know, he was a good leader and in the end he was the epitome of everything that, uh, that Rangers wanted to be. Here's De Canio. Now Mike Namara, chance here for Celtic. John Hughes is there! It's off the crossbar! The Celtic players can't believe him. Gascoigne might punish them now on the counter-attack. Celtic are fit in the back. Load up, wide for our bats. There's Gascoigne! Just five league matches later, only one of which Rangers had won, the old rivals met again. Celtic were top of the table, if only by one goal, and it was another famous old firm occasion. There's a slip by 
O'Neill and Loudrup to win. Rangers look for a goal and get one in the eighth minute from Brian Loudrup. Here's Cullen. Gascoigne took that beautifully. The pass for Loudrup. Kerr comes off his line. Penalty. 20 minutes to go. Gascoigne steps up. And Kerr has saved a Paul Gascoigne penalty. And allowed to go on is Alberts. He's got Van Bossen with him. Oh my goodness! Gascoigne's already had his penalty saved for Rangers. It's Pierre Van Hoydonk to keep his nerve for Celtic and keep them top of the table. And Gorham has matched Kerr's achievement. Uh, Andrew Gorham had some fantastic uh, performances for Rangers. And although we had a good defence and he's not called upon that often, some of the times that he was called upon his saves were breathtaking. And there are, I guess, exaggerated in the sense that a lot of teams, they say, you know, oh, we attacked and we had this opportunity and it was the only one we had and Gorham prevented us with a magnificent save. And I think Tommy Burns especially would think that he would suffer maybe more than most managers at the hands of Gorham over the period. And uh, quite rightfully, um, he got a deserved place. I don't think any player played over a period of seasons with more consistency than Andy Gorham did. Rangers Celtic Part 3 provided another remarkable chapter for the old firm legend. It was to be another crucial victory for Rangers in the quest for nine in a row. week Rangers had been hit by a flu epidemic. Richard Goff and Brian Loudrup were both missing and several other players were less than 100% fit. Among them the much criticised Dane Eric Bo Anderson. At 1-1 he came on for the final 14 minutes of the match. the most dramatic of Rangers victories by the time the fourth league match with Celtic came round the tension in the city had become almost unbearable Celtic had won the Scottish Cup tie between the clubs ten days previously so just how big a psychological blow would that be for Rangers I think everybody had a nervousness about them and uh, it's hard to explain to you you know we, we won the fire in all cylinders uh, there was games where we were going out and we were struggling but we were getting the victories and then there was games and we steamrolled, you know, it was just a, it was an up and down season, you know. And Celtic were our closest challenges. Uh, obviously they're trying to protect us, nine in a row. Uh, but we managed, we managed to overcome that. Winning the four matches, I would say, was probably the biggest influence in winning the championship. Um, but uh, tremendous achievement by our players to overcome a team who must have been at the peak of motivation in terms of trying to stop us. Sometimes a bit of extra pressure doesn't do it any harm and losing in a cup game and then having to go back a week or so later to, to play in a league match, you know, added a little bit to us. Badly hit by injuries again, Walter Smith brought back the inspirational Mark Hately and a goalkeeper was signed from Manchester City's third team. We had to bring Andy Double in to fill in goals and if anybody can have sympathy for a player, uh, we must have sympathy for him getting thrown in. Uh, to a game like that and no, fully realising what nine in a row meant and then in the few days leading up to that game finding out what it actually meant and having to go in and perform and uh, you know, our whole team deserved tremendous credit for winning that one. 
know, we were like cage lines or pride was hurt. Celtic had beaten us two 0 and you know they, they added a wee bit of insult to injury when they started doing the their huddle when they beat us, and you know, and they'd never done that before in any other games. And all of a sudden they beat Rangers, and they started all that. So we were, you could say, we were up for it. And certainly wasn't practice in the training ground. A lapse of concentration there between the Canio and Grant. And Celtic have paid a penalty. Three Rangers players getting forward here. It's through for Ian Durant. Well, he snatched at that one. Yeah. There's Ian Durant coming through. The goalkeeper's off his line. Sensationally take the lead. Again, Celtic push everyone forward. They don't have the height though to worry the Rangers defence. The final whistle sounds, and that wraps it up for Rangers. The fans celebrate. I would say that was the game that won us nine in a row. That's the game for me, which killed Celtic off basically, and uh, it was brilliant to play in it. But the enormous high of the victory over Celtic was followed by the low of defeat at Kilmarnock. The pressure was on again, but wins over Dunfermline and Ray Throvers set up a much anticipated title winning party against Motherwell at Ibrox. It was to be one of the biggest letdowns of the entire nine years as Motherwell simply refused to enter into the spirit of the expected celebrations. And so it was on to Tannadice. Yeah, we played very well that night. Tremendous goal from Brian Loudrop. Again, we mentioned that an unusual occurrence in a Trevor Stephen header in one of our earlier championship wins but uh, I'm sure everybody will remember that headed one uh, I can't remember him scoring a headed goal but it was a great cross from Charlie Miller and a, a brilliant header by Brian but a terrific performance, terrific team performance that night 11 minutes of the first half gone low drop brings his tinny of a light to the glorious goal the moment belongs to Rangers the journey, which had begun with that Gary Stevens goal in Hamilton nine years earlier, had finally ended. Rangers were champions for the ninth season in a row. Uh, it was a fantastic feeling to know that it was over with. I always had the. Uh, I thought in the back of my mind that although I had managed to win five championships in a row, he would always have been remembered as the one who didn't win uh, the ninth championship of your life, or even the sixth one, as far as I was concerned. So that was always a lot of pressure for myself, and I was delighted when that was over with. It was after midnight when the team bus finally arrived back at Ibrox, where thousands of fans waited to acclaim the players whose place in Rangers history was now assured. Paul Gascoigne, who had led the singing all the way from Dundee, was still in his strip. The party was only just beginning. Three days later, the champions returned from Tynecastle to lead another Ibrox celebration, this time the biggest one of all. What an era, what a nine years this has been. Tremendous. And if Terry Butcher hadn't broken his leg, you could be looking at what in a row? Eleven? Eleven in a row. But uh, we should be very grateful for what we've got and never underestimate our achievements. It takes a wee bit of time to sink in that, you know, even just now, you know, it's hard for me, a boy for East End of Glasgow with nine championship medals. And I keep saying this, but it's true, it's just, it's incredible just to think that I've got the nine league medals and it's part of history. I really love to be alone without all the aches and pain. Get through it anyway We'll get up 